Uh, we're going to be talking about coastal resiliency. My name is Aaron Viles. I am the grassroots organizing manager for CARE2, which if you don't know what CARE2 is, we are a community of 40 million people online working to make the world a better place. If you have any campaigns you'd like to work on, go start a petition. I'll help you out. Uh, so we've got an amazing panel today, but I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and start off just a little bit from my perspective on, on coastal resiliency and, and what that is. I've been with CARE2 for a couple of years. Uh, before that, I was in the environmental advocacy field for uh, a couple of decades. Uh, I lived in New Orleans. I worked with the Gulf Restoration Network. Uh, I'm now on their board, so I get to keep uh, working on those issues. But uh, I had not heard the term coastal resiliency uh, probably until late uh, 2005. So uh, August 28th, 2005, uh, uh, I was driving to Lafayette, Louisiana, not really sure if I'd ever see uh, our newly purchased home uh, ever again. Uh, so Hurricane Katrina was coming through. There was a mandatory evacuation in New Orleans. New Orleans, as I had learned, I had been there for a few years already, uh, but it, they call it a cereal bowl. Uh, it is a city with levees around it that is, about half of it is below sea level. So when a storm has kind of got you in the target, uh, it's not a very comforting uh, feeling to leave be behind a home that's in that cereal bowl and a community that you uh, begin to love and people you care about. So we drove away and then s started watching CNN a day later and saw like the worst things, because of course they show the worst things, right? They didn't show any like... Google Maps of your house, like, oh, everything's fine in my neighborhood. We were very fortunate. We uh, bought in the Sliver by the River, which is a higher elevation area, a historic area that's closer to the, to the Mississippi River, which you might not think this, but rivers are actually higher, uh, tend to be in floodplains. The, the ground's a little bit higher, close to the river, as to further away from it. So uh, we got very, we were very fortunate. We had some, uh, you know, hurricane wind uh, blew down our fence, and we had some roof damage, and our uh, our refrigerator really stunk. So, and that was the one thing uh, which, there was actually a book of the refrigerators of Katrina, and it was these photos of all these, all these refrigerators sitting on the curb waiting for the garbage uh, to come and get them, because when you go away from your home for a few months without electricity, and if you left anything in the freezer and the refrigerator, not pleasant. Uh, so we had some shrimp in our refrigerator that a friend of mine had given us, and that was just, you know, it's like kind of rookie move number one when you evacuate. Uh, anyway, we don't do that now. We take everything with us. But yeah, you didn't really think about resiliency. I knew that our wetlands were in trouble in uh, South Louisiana. Uh, but when we came back, we saw just what that meant to the community when you don't have uh, a resilient and robust coastal ecosystem around you. You know, we were evacuated for months. People couldn't live in the city for months. It took years for communities to come back. Some communities still aren't back. I mean, there are areas that very patchwork, very, you know, uh, our mayor at the time uh, decided to let the market dictate how we would recover mostly because he lost his spine uh, after talking about some more visionary things. Uh, but there's been lots of uh, fantastic successes and changes as well. So, uh, you know, there's been major changes to New Orleans uh, just in terms of the civil society and, you know, things that were, fi were broken for a very long time finally got fixed, things like the courts. Schools are kind of getting better, uh, although certainly not you know, slam dunk there. Uh, there's a lot of institutional changes that need to be made. Uh, and one thing I found working in the environment, I was working on red snapper management before Hurricane Katrina, which, you know, you get a little bit of a timeout on snapper management when a major storm comes through and destroys all the fishing ecosystem or the you know, infrastructure, right? So the fish were fine. There just weren't really any boats to go after them. So, you know, the lawsuits we had continued to work and, you know, the management discussions kind of went on pause for a while. Uh, but what we decided is that it made a lot more sense to be talking about wetlands and the vulnerability of these communities on the coast. Uh, we started a campaign we called Flood Washington, Not Our Coast. We generated, so when the storm happened, we were a little tiny regional environmental group with a few staff. We had a Yahoo group email list of active activists, uh, which we thought was 1,200 people, but it actually turned out to be 700 people when we uploaded it into like the better software. 
so, you know, we had those kind of move on style uh, campaigns. We decided to launch one around the first one we did was on Red Snapper before the storm. The response was tepid at best. Uh, after the storm, we launched the, the Flood Washington campaign and we took our email list to about 100,000 people, uh, you know, and it was this exponential growth, right? Everyone wants a viral campaign. Uh, this was crazy to watch it happen. And what we, our message was really, really simple. Like we want, you're gonna build the levees. We know you're gonna have to rebuild the levees because they've been exposed to be a sham, uh, but we need to rebuild the wetlands at the same time we're doing that if we really wanna keep our community safe. Uh, and it was a message that resonated that, you know, we worked across the political spectrum and built the organization. You guys are activists, you guys care about building organizations. It's important to message on things that make sense to people and that matter at the time that it really does matter. And we got some fantastic victories. There's a thing called the Mr. Go, the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet, which was a little used shipping channel, uh, which we renamed the Hurricane Highway because it was a open water area that allowed water to come into New Orleans and kind of uh, really amplify the strength of the storm surge because of the way that that structure was built. So we, you know, for for decades, the community had wanted Mr. Go closed. Uh, they knew it was a, a risk. They knew it made them more vulnerable. They knew it was a waste of taxpayer dollars re uh, dredging this thing that rarely ever got used. Uh, and finally, in the wake of the storm, we had the you know the political will, and we you know it's a congressionally authorized shipping channel. So to deauthorize it, you need Congress to act. Not always the easiest thing to do. Uh, so we got that done, though, and that was uh, the community was very relieved and glad to see it. There's a lot of other fantastic things that happened in the wake of the storm in terms of the kind of community's awareness and understanding. But I don't have to talk about that because we actually have uh, an uh, expert here who's going to talk about his perspective on on how that came about as well. Uh, so that's great. I want to introduce you to the panel. Uh, I've talked to you long enough, but we've got some fantastic experts to talk about uh, coastal resiliency and what it means to them. Uh, and I'm going to uh, the bios are in uh, the uh, the program if you want to read the, the the longer version, but I am going to just introduce some folks. Uh, so Dale is the senior. Uh, Dale Morris, there at the end, is the senior economist at the Royal Netherlands Embassy in Washington, D.C. He does not even have much of a Dutch accent, uh, but uh, he's with them. And he actually coordinates their water management efforts in the United States, particularly Louisiana. So he's done a lot of work in my hometown, uh, but also Florida, Texas, California, and Virg uh, Virginia, focused on uh, climate adaptation and sustainability, uh, working with flood protection and flood risk management, coastal and floodplain restoration, basically all the same the stuff that we're here for. Uh, Dale works on it every day, which is fantastic, with a, with a kind of unique pers perspective. He's the co-founder and co-director of the Dutch Dialogues, which he'll tell us more about. Uh, but more importantly, he is he served in Congress, worked in Congress, I guess sir, you weren't elected. Nope. But, no. uh, but uh, he also served in the Air Force and has graduated from the University of Pittsburgh and the University of Virginia, uh, is an avid motorcyclist, uh, a hockey fan, and a whitewater junkie. So uh, find him later to talk about some of that. Next to him is Serge Dedina, who's the executive director of Wild Coast and also the mayor of Imperial Beach, California. So we do have some elected officials here. Uh, and uh, you don't really find very many uh, mayors who tote their own water bottles and uh, are the executive director of a great environmental uh, group. I'd like to hear more about how that happened. But uh, today, he's going to be talking about uh, his work on sea level rise adaptation planning in Imperial Beach. If you haven't been to Imperial Beach, uh, if you've been to Tijuana, you've probably been to Imperial Beach. You just didn't know it happened. Uh, you drove through it on the way. Uh, but it's a, a, a very nice community right on the beach on the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, he's helping lead the effort for beach cities in San Diego County uh, to uh, adapt as well and become more resilient through the San Diego Association of Governments. Uh, he's also working uh, in Mexico to carry out an extensive climate adaptation program for mangrove ecosystems. So mangroves are fantastic in terms of uh, resiliency and are an important element uh, to make a, a natural system help protect us. Uh, his team in Mexico City was uh, actually just last week carrying out a climate adaptation planning workshop for marine reserve directors from Mexico, Peru, and Cuba. You gotta love a bio that includes like what they were doing last week. Uh, this is like hot off the presses stuff, folks. Uh, you usually don't get that. Uh, and he's working in partnership with the Cuban National uh, Park Service. So that is very cool as we're opening up our boundaries with uh, Cuba, helping them assist in management and stewardship programs for coral reef and mangrove ecosystems. Uh, next to me, 
uh, Rear Admiral Ann Phillips, uh, U.S. Navy, retired. She served in every warfare group of the surface Navy. So destroyers, aircraft carriers, amphibious and replenishment ships. Uh, she's in the Navy for 31 years on active duty. She commissioned and commanded the USS Mustin uh, Destroyer Squadron 28 and Expeditionary Strike Group 2. Uh, sounds very impressive. These are all amphibious expeditionary forces uh, on the East Coast in the US. From 2009 to 2012, she served on the chief, as the Chief of Naval Operations uh, Climate Change Task Force and Energy Task Force. So she actually was developing and implementing the climate change adaptation and energy reduction strategies for the Navy, which a uh, very important time for us to be learning from the Navy, who was actually leading on issues that uh, are very important to this community. Uh, when she retired in 2014, she completed her MBA at the College of William and Mary, the Mason School of Business. Uh, she also worked on the infrastructure working or chaired the infrastructure working group for the Hampton Roads Sea Level Rise Preparedness and Resilience Intergovernmental Pilot Planning Project, uh, which was working to develop a collaborative and government and a community approach to address these uh, issues of resiliency uh, in the Re Hampton Roads, Virginia area. So she uh, works uh, as um, a member of several local, regional, and national nonprofit boards. She coordinates an evolving wetlands restoration project for her neighborhood, and she comes to events like this, which is fantastic to bring a, a unique perspective on issues that uh, are so important. So uh, really fantastic panel. I'm excited to hear from them. So although I work for the Dutch Embassy, I am not Dutch. Um, completely uh, American, 100% born and raised in Pittsburgh. Um, so I'm not a happy camper this morning, given the Caps uh, went over the Penguins last night, but that's how it goes. Um, anyway, uh, um, so I'm an economist, and um, in 2005, working with the embassy, doing energy policy and productivity and uh, stimulus to productivity and innovation, um, I was asked to go to New Orleans, November 2005, uh, with the ambassador, invited by Senator Mary Landrieu. We were the first foreign delegation uh, that was invited down there to see what had happened. Um, <clears throat> what I saw there shocked me. I had worked on Capitol Hill for a number of years. I had seen the good side of government, and I had seen in New Orleans what happens when government takes things for granted. It was a failure of government at all levels, as well as a natural disaster. And it motivated me to try to help that poor place. The things I saw on that first trip in the Lower Ninth Ward and in Gentilly and in communities like Lakeview, which was upper middle class, doctors, lawyers, um, college professors, um, what, they, what their homes looked like was awful. And that motivated me to do the work that I'm doing today. Um, and it meshes still with my work, um, economic work, um, coastal, coastal communities around the world, um, about 45% of World uh, gross domestic product is produced in coastal areas. About 41% of the people in the world live in those coastal areas. So if we do nothing, we're going to have a tremendous amount of disruption as well as a huge loss of life. Um, there are 25 million people living in Jakarta right now. Most of them live eight feet below sea level, protected by a little seawall. And if that seawall collapses, you're gonna see destruction and loss of life like you cannot imagine. And they're waiting, waiting, waiting to do something about it. Um, in the Netherlands, the Dutch are very good at this. They've been dealing with water, living below sea level um, for 800 years, so they've made a lot of mistakes. They've had a, loss, a, a large loss of life, but they've innovated in a way that now they have arguably um, the safest delta in the world. Living below sea level is not a problem there. 70% of the people live at or below sea level, and 70% of GDP is produced at or below sea level. So you can do this. You have to make investments. Um, and um, it's important to understand just that perspective there. Um, we are working, um, again, in, in various places. Think of Katrina. 80% um, of the city was flooded for three weeks. What that does to the infrastructure as well as people's lives is just um, horrible. Um, Hurricane Sandy. So right now, four years after Hurricane Sandy, 400,000 people still live within the 1% floodplain. It's not going to change. New York is pretty desirable. A lot of people like to live there. So how are you going to deal with that? Um, in the Bay Area, you're all, some of you are younger. Um, some of you use these things. Um, do you realize that the largest U.S. companies in the world are not the GEs or the ExxonMobiles? They are the Internet companies based in and around. Uh, San Francisco Bay. 
So Facebook, Apple, and Google, these are some of the most highly valued companies in the world right now. They are at huge risk to sea level rise in the bay. We, if they don't protect themselves, we're going to do something. You've got you to challenge it. So in all of these areas, there's a lot of information from Munich RE and Swiss RE and all the reinsurance industry, uh, industries, um, companies. Th they have these maps and graphs. <clears throat> the threat of coastal storms is not decreasing. It's increasing. Over the last 25 years, um, there is a very clear trend, almost a doubling of the frequency of coastal storms. In Norfolk, Anne, is it nine of the 12 most damaging coastal storms over the last 100 years have occurred in the last 15? There's a trend for you. Um, so those are some perspectives just to let you know what we're dealing with. Um, in New Orleans, we, we started there again. We, we started to help the Army Corps of Engineers. We started to help the city council, and we started to help the state agency, the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority, as well as the Department of Transportation and Development, understand how you build back and how you increase your protection level in a smart way. The federal government sent $150 billion to New Orleans. $14 billion of that was to repair the perimeter protection system. So the levees that are around the city, as well as create new floodgates um, and navigation gates and pump stations to, to dewater, protect the city and dewater it. So that was done in 2011. But in 2008, after a number of visits to the Netherlands with folks from New Orleans, we kept telling them, look, you just can't rely on that one piece of infrastructure. If the water gets in it, gets over it or gets under it, if it fails or it's overtopped, um, you've got huge problems. Moreover, in New Orleans, they have recurrent flooding. You get these, these uh, floods in the summertime just because of too much rain coming down. This is the second largest pumping station in the world that gets overwhelmed by storms four or five or seven times a year. And what that does is it puts people's cars uh, underwater, it puts people's homes underwater on a regular recurrent basis. Who would want to live with that? Insurance companies don't like the risk. So New Orleans needed to deal not only with its coastal risk and its storm risk, but also its internal water management risk. And we help them do that through a series of Dutch dialogues. These are its workshop model that we developed, that we, we developed down there and that we've used it elsewhere. Um, we became a protagonist, challenging the local government, challenging the local people to rethink how they manage water within the city. And we wanted to flip um, the equation or flip the thought processes regarding um, bringing water into the city because that actually creates more resiliency. If you know anything about the Netherlands, there are canals, there are, um, there, there are beautiful cities, there are water cities, and New Orleans is a city, a water city with no water in it, and we're transforming that in a lot of ways through the, um, through the Dutch Dialogues output, the Urban Water Plan, which came after that, and the Resilience Plan, which now incorporated the water plan. And I encourage you to look at this. It's called living, go to livingwithwater.com. That's the urban water plan. The city council and the mayor have, they've incorporated into the long-term planning and it's being implemented. And through another series of workshops, we helped with the city, we helped the city of New Orleans get a $141 million grant um, to <clears throat> implement a pilot called Mirabeau. Aaron, you may know about Mirabeau, it's up in Gentilly. So this is a funny story. <clears throat> but um, Mirabeau was a, uh, a site of a convent from the Sisters of St. Anthony. They were there since 1807, um, repeatedly flooded in this area. It's a middle-class neighborhood, predominantly black, but middle-class neighborhood. And um, the convent was flooded. The area is flooded. Katrina really flooded them. They were living up in Baton Rouge for six months trying to figure out what to do with the convent. Lightning struck, burned the convent to the ground. So now they have this 25-acre parcel in the mm -hmm. middle of Gentilly, which is, in, which is an opportunity. That's empty space you can do something with. So the nuns had heard what we were doing with the Dutch Dialogues and the Urban Water Plan, and they told the city, we will give you, we will lease to you for 99 years the use of this property if you use it for the water plan um, designation. And so what this little 25-acre site is going to be um, is a water storage area from when it, for it rains, um, it'll be ball fields and gardens otherwise, so the community can use it. Multiple benefits here. Um, and when it rains a lot, water is going to flow in there. It does two things. One, it takes this water storage off the street so the cars don't flood and people's houses don't flood. But it also makes sure that the investment that the city would need to make, otherwise need to make, in the pumping system doesn't have to be made. 
So now the city has saved money. They don't have to increase the pumping capacity, but they can store the water in the environment. And this is, the this is a typical project that we've developed with New Orleans, is use the environment in a way, use the space that Katrina created to make that city more resilient. Um, and it's being implemented right now. Um, it's a 20-year plan, $20 billion. Um, it's got a long way to go, but we're, we're working, we're moving that forward. We worked in Norfolk. Um, and Anne's going to talk about Norfolk. We did a Dutch dialogues there. We think we were, in a, we were a protagonist there to get the city and some you other folks. <laughs> we, we, we forced the issue, and um, they're moving forward down there. But I want to talk to you. If you look at coastal resiliency, you have other areas in Louisiana. Many of you do not know that the coast of Louisiana is one of the most productive ecosystems in the U.S., if not the world. 40% um, of our fish, 40% of our oil and gas, um, a whole bunch of recreation occurs. This is a really productive ecosystem, and it is disappearing at a rate of one football field every two hours. Sea level rise, as well as um, problems from oil and grass, uh, whether the cuts that the oil and gas industry made through the wetlands, it's introducing salt into the, west, into the wetland and killing the, the grasses and thus de degrading ecosystems. So the state of Louisiana in 2012, in 2007 and 2012, and it now again in 2017, they have a master plan to deal with that. And the bad thing that happened there in 2010 called the BP oil spill, in fact, became the savior of, or the pos potential savior of those wetlands because under the Restore Act passed by Congress, um, most of the money that the BP had to pay and all the other companies had to pay for that um, disaster, as well as all the environmental penalties that are come under there under, under NEPA and NERDA, I think it is. Anyway, all that money has to be spent on coastal restoration and protection. They are still going to lose a lot of their land. They are not rebuilding back everything that was. But what is admirable, and I think this is a takeaway I want you to take, that state government, through a series of processes, has engaged the public and engaged the industry and engaged the environmental community and said, what are we going to save and what are we not going to save because we can't do it all? That's a process we all need to think about here in the United States. What are we going to save? What's worth saving? What can we save? And what do we have to understand is going away? It's a very important um, process there. Um, and I'm going to leave you with three takeaways through all this work. So we're working in Boston, which has a long-term sea level rise problem. Anyone familiar with Boston? Okay, you know that whole Back Bay area, a lot, a lot of really expensive property. It's at huge risk in about 25 or 30 years. Um, that property is, people aren't going to move away from it, but so what do you do with that kind of a situation? The whole Boston waterfront um, is at huge risk. So just San Francisco Bay, they have huge challenges there, not just sea level rise challenges, but they have a seismic risk. Um, the seismic risk can actually exacerbate the sea level rise and the flood protection risk. Oh, and there is the Bay Delta, which is only 50 miles inland, which looks like the Netherlands. It's below sea level. And it is the conduit for the drinking water for Los Angeles and San Diego and my neighbor here. 40% um, of the drinking water down there comes through that delta, and it has a flood risk as well as a seismic risk. So we need to make these choices. What are we going to invest our money in? Um, we're working in other places in Houston. But what we've seen is this. Governance in the U.S. is not up to snuff. The governance models here, our federal system, does not permit us to deal with this like the Dutch or like other countries deal with. The Canadians deal with this better than us. The British deal with this better than us. We don't deal with it very well. It's based on a grounded in our Constitution. Okay, but federalism is making it very difficult for the Federal Department of Transportation and the State Department of Transportation in Virginia and the State Department of Environmental Protection and the Office of Community uh, Housing, Community Housing or something down there to collaborate to find ways to pool their monies to build something better and cheaper so that we can get more of it. Um, procurement. Um, <clears throat> in New York, after Sandy, they, they um, designed a project to protect Lower Manhattan. It's called the Big U. And it's, one, it's mostly funded. It's, it's to soften up the, shore, the shoreline, put some green infrastructure there. Oh, and yes, they wanted to put a bike path on top of it. So you get these, these amenities, right? There's bike paths all in New York around there, and that was the extension. So that'd be great to put the bike path. It doesn't cost much. The State Department of Transportation does not want that bike path there because they're afraid of the liability that when that bike path crosses a road, they're going to be in trouble. Now, that's just plain stupid. 
and our procurement processes in, 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 in the uh, our liability issues and the government uh, procurement are just um, harming our ability to implement multiple benefit projects. And another thing that happens, government procurement is simply this. It's always lowest cost option. While you get what you pay for. In the Netherlands, they combine um, projects and they combine goals where they're trying to pr produce social amenity, environmental amenity, amenity, economic, increase economic e efficiency, and increase flood protection in their projects. And thus, the projects may cost a little bit more, but the benefits are much higher. So your return on investment is, is very clear. In the U.S., we can't do that because we're always asking our contractors, give us the least costly option. And that's what we used to do, and we can't do that anymore. We are reactive in this country. We are not thinking about long term. Um, <clears throat> we have four-year election cycles or two-year <laughs> election cycles, and that's what our politicians love, and they don't care about 30 years from now. Meanwhile, these kinds of changes in, in the sea level, in sea level rise and climate, they are long-term challenges, and we need to be prepared for it, and we're not. Um, and one other thing, and this is, I'll direct this at my field, um, <clears throat> we know that ecosystem services, so the benefits they, that Mother Nature provides to us um, in provisioning and all, all these different kind of things, we don't, economists can't value them that well. We need to, because that's how we're going to increase the return on investment on some of these projects. Um, the economic profession has a long way to go here, and I'll leave it at that. I'm the mayor of Imperial Beach, California, which happens to be the grooviest, coolest little blue-collar beach town in the entire coast of California. Uh, wow, that luckily, is quite that, a statement. And, and that is caveat, because blue-collar, we're the only blue-collar uh, beach town left in Southern <laughs> California. Um, so that makes us a little different, completely surrounded by protected open space that I actually had a hand in protecting every inch of, which when I was growing up as a kid, was considered by the city fathers and the village idiot mayors that we had, really different now, um, considered to be the enemy of progress, right? Open space, the enemy of progress, because they wanted to fill in every inch of our open space, wetlands and estuaries and the ocean with marinas and high rises. You get the picture, of, all of you know where that was going. We stopped that, and now as we deal with sea level rise and what's happening far into the future, we know, thank God, we saved that open space. Thank God we did, because that essentially is the cheapest, most cost-effective way that we're going to have to deal with um, what's coming at us. Not only what's coming at us is what we're dealing with right now. And sea level rise is happening. Coastal flooding is happening, especially with El Nino. We're seeing some of the highest tides that we've ever seen and, and the worst coastal flooding we've ever seen, even without much surf or, or wind so, and storm. So, and talk to you about the process that we're engaged in um, to basically carry out a sea level rise adaptation planning process and then to figure out what that means. And then just going to talk a little bit about the work I do at Wild Coast, the international conservation team um, that, I, uh, that I run and, and co-founded with Wallace J. Nichols in, in 2016. We're really focused on big scale, large scale ecosystem conservation projects. Right now we have a major project with the government of Mexico and their protected area commission to conserve huge acres, uh, areas of mangroves, basically as a climate adaptation strategy. That project is, is, has been supported by the German Development Agency as well as the World Wildlife Fund, Carl Slim Foundation, and a whole host of other foundations. But the idea is that we're helping the National Park Service actually get concessions to mangroves along shoreline in the federal maritime zone. So you don't have uh, development in those places. So they're really trying to w work on that. We've gotten uh, protection for over a thousand miles of coastline with the National Parks Commission as well as uh, getting concessions to mangroves. And now we're looking at the whole issue of blue carbon so we can actually start measuring uh, the sequestration value of, uh, of mangroves and look at if we can actually get those out on the, on the market to, to get some incentives for, uh, for conservation. The big takeaway for me, and I want all of you guys to think about this, and, and this is really the issue, how do you pay for all this, right? This is absolutely fundamental. The question we'll all hopefully leave with is, what are the strategies all of us are going to have to develop to pay for the things that we, ha we must and have to do to, to save us from the future that's coming at us? And then Cuba, we started working in Cuba two years ago on a pilot project, but very impressed with the focus on mangroves. Uh, there's a whole campaign, Manglar Vivo, which has arguably one of the coolest videos I've ever seen. Uh, an entire village dancing to tr tropical music, talking about saving mangroves, but uh, doing a really ambitious mangrove reforestation program. We just had the Cuban, Peruvian, and Mexican uh, marine reserve directors uh, in Mexico City 
to, to, plan, to start lurking on planning for a climate adaptation for all the marine reserves in those countries. And that's something we're working on with the Mexican National Park Service is climate adaptation planning, because they have to do all of those things. So anyway, um, let's talk about what we did in Imperial Beach. It's a city of 28,000 people. Um, we have a poverty rate of 26%, something I'm not proud of, the highest in San Diego County. 30% of our kids live in poverty. The lowest sales tax by a fifth of any city in, the, in, in San Diego County. So definitely we are a resource-starved community, an open space abundant community. Um, and so this, this challenge of sea level rise is something that we're taking very seriously. We have decided to embrace our future. We have decided that our role as a city is to be a statewide, national, and international leader on and helping other cities understand that they must and how they can deal with this issue. That's something I'm proud of dealing with, with my entire city council, all five of us, Republican and Democrat, our entire city staff, and, and, and a lot of folks in our community understand that we have no choice but to do this. Ironically, and Admiral, you know this city, the city to the north, which is one of the wealthiest cities in the world, separated on a thin strand of, a thin strand of sand, um, has decided that they don't have to deal with sea level rise because they're different than we are. It's, they told us that, yeah, that town down there, yeah, they're different. They're, they're going to be affected. We're fine. So <laughs> that was actually really interesting to hear them say that. But um, so we um, got funding from the California Coastal Conservancy and foundations to carry out an ambitious adaptation plan and then economic impact study um, just this last year, we finished that, and now we're embarked on what's called local coastal planning update. So the California Coast Commission requires that each coastal city has local coastal plans that basically it's like a, ma a master plan or a general plan for your city. So right now we just hired a consultant to help us update that to incorporate all the things that we'll need to do for sea level rise. So we, that our, our, our original plan was evaluating the coastal vulnerabilities from sea level rise and coastal hazards. Um, the range of adaptation strategies, including trade-offs and economics, and then recommending strategies, and this is really important, that are politically digestible and economically feasible. Politically digestible and economically feasible. This isn't a red state, blue state thing. It's not a bipartisan thing. It's not a political thing. We're trying to, do, to go a little old school on this. What are the specific tangible things we need to do on coastal flooding? And do we need to replace pump stations? Do we need to... Um, create some more open space, things that our old school blue collar community can, can deal with, a lot of Navy, retired Navy folks, right? And so to get behind it, so um, that's been interesting. But we've had a long history of dealing with flooding. Here's some fo uh, photos from uh, 1983 El Nino. Uh, a lot of our residents have vivid memories of the, of the flooding that, we, that occurred then, 15 to 30 foot surf with big winds, things that we haven't seen since then. Um, and then we really evaluated the uh, impacts from things like coastal erosion, nuisance flooding, inundation, and then just general big surf flooding. We have more nuisance flooding, and I've been there since 1971, than we've ever seen. Basically, in the winter, the south end of our beach, this photo here on the right, is always underwater, something that I don't remember when I was a kid, right? Um, we're seeing the highest king tides that we've ever seen. The difference between erosion now and then when I was a kid is Obviously, back then, and, and we get most of our erosion from the big winter storms like we just had on Saturday in May, right? So what's happening is that because of climate change, we're getting more instability and more weather events um, year-round. And so even if you look, talk to Newport Beach, who as of recently didn't believe in climate change or sea level rise, maybe they're changing, a lot of the erosion is happening in the summer. You're getting these big southern hemisphere surf events that are causing significant erosion in places that receive south swells in Malibu and uh, Orange County, and then even in, on our beach, which we get surf from all, all year round. So that, that's something that's new for us. And then again, we get these storm events on, it was May, um, May 6th. Um, we, on Saturday, we had major rains, big surf and big winds uh, record for that, for that time. Well, then the year before it, we had a record storm in April. Um, and the year before that, we had a storm that looked like a hurricane in February. So we're just seeing a lot more instability, and that's causing us some significant problems. So we, we know we have to deal with it. Um, this is our bayfront. That's something that is important. 
cities assuming that what's coming out of us is coming from the Pacific Ocean, but if you're on an estuary or a bayfront, you realize that it's coming to you at all sides, and that's going to be the real challenge. It's because we've been programmed, those of us who deal with coastal hazards, to think about surf and erosion, but really it's what's going to happen on our bayfront, which is at sea level uh, as well. And we have a lot of folks who live in some pretty low-income neighborhoods in that area. So this was a king tide last year, the highest. We've never seen flooding like that. No wind. No big surf, just a high tide in November. Um, and so we wanted to evaluate all the impacts to our schools, roads, uh, stormwater system, and then any hazardous materials. So we did some good maps, and we had a really good scientist and team working on our project, a guy named Dave, uh, Dave Revel, who uh, worked with a guy named Gary Griggs at uh, Santa Cruz, who wrote sort of the, guide, the, 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 the California Coastal Commission sea, lies, sea Level Rise Guidance Policy. And what it really shows is that all, because of sea level rise, all the historic sort of drainage areas start and flooding areas start becoming prominent. And we have to become a lot more cognizant of what that means. So um, areas of tidal inundation are really around all three sides of our city. And what we, the sobering thing for our council, and again, you know, you're right, politicians, we're elected to think four years down the road. We're, we're elected to really think of today. Now on Twitter, it's all about today, right? And so we're talking about things that are going to happen 100 years from now. And that's really hard for us and our residents to wrap their head around. But the sobering reality is uh, we're looking at $160 million uh, in losses and damages to private property if we do nothing, $160 million that we don't have. We have zero of that money, zero. We have no money at all. So on a statewide level, in a state like California, where inequality is growing, the, the poles of rich and poor are growing greater, and that's reflected in cities and, uh, and poverty rates. Um, a city like communities in Malibu can do a geologic hazard zone and fundraise among their residents $30 million. They, that was done recently, or $25 million to deal with beach erosion, right? To get sand dumped on the beach. Like, we can't do that. Right, so that, that's a very real issue that we're thinking about when it comes to um, really paying for this stuff. And so what, what did we find? Well, in our evaluation, sobering, 40% of all our roads are impacted, 30% of our parcels are impacted. Um, we've identified the most vulnerable neighborhoods. We have 43 things that we can do. One of those is jetties. And I had a guy, with, you know, I surf in the mornings, um, and a buddy of mine I've known since I was 13 starts screaming at me about the jetties that I'm building tomorrow to deal with sea level rise. And I'm like, dude, we had a study done, just a study, 43 things we can do, one of which includes jetties that we have no money to pay for. So as we're bobbing in the surf, he made me pledge that if, even if I had money, we wouldn't build jetties. Well, I, I can say that because in 100 years, I'm not going to be around. So, but it was just kind of <laughs> funny how people pick up certain things. Um, and I'll end here. The most cost of, the smartest thing we can do, the most cost, of, cost effective thing we can do in the long term is to retreat. That's it, is to retreat, is to buy up coastal property. And so uh, that's really, really interesting to do. Um, two things we, we're doing um, right now. Because we're working with a billion dollar special warfare naval facility that we actually treat their sewage, as they're moving the special warfare facility from a flood prone area in Coronado down to near our beach, a higher area, uh, to, essentially to, to deal with uh, a, a sea level rise. Um, we have to move our sewer system, our pump station on our beach, a, a block inland. It's going to cost us $10 million. We don't have right now. So we're going we're, we're to do that right away because we have to. Right? We feel we have to work with the Navy in addition to the fact that that's pump stations are already flooding. So that's one thing we're doing. Number two, we had an 80-acre parcel of land, a lot like what you, you dealt with like in Louisiana. And um, the guy I beat is mayor, and he asked why I ran for mayor, because the guy I beat wanted to spend all his time building in wetlands. And I, I saved all the wetlands in our community 30 years ago, so I couldn't spend my time doing what I did when I was a kid. And so the minute I got elected, we worked with the Port of San Diego and the City of San Diego. We're turning that 80 acres into a mitigation bank, a, a wetland restoration area. The Port of San Diego sell mitigation credits to developers. The net benefits from that mitigation bank will go into climate adaptation strategies in the neighborhoods around that wetland site. So it's a win-win. We save 80 acres, turn it into a wetland, flood, a flood-absorbing wetland, 
and then the, we can sell those mitigation credits and then help us deal with climate adaptation. So I'm really proud of that strategy. And then the 10 acres of upland area that's disturbed, people can develop, which is fine with me. So it was a good trade-off. And then finally, new stormwater rules in California. So give us an incentive to do uh, stormwater retention basins. I just, we just bought a slum uh, owned by a horrible slumlord who lives in a beachfront man mansion in the community that doesn't believe in sea level rise. And uh, we're turning that into a storm rider retention basin and affordable housing. So there are a lot of options out there for cities. Um, but if you're in a city on the coast and you're not dealing with this, tell your mayor that you're already like behind and they need to get on the, on the page. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks also to my co-panelists for some incredible conversations this morning. I found myself sitting here going, yeah, 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 all the way through. Um, so uh, it's, it's an honor to be here. Aaron, thank you for the great introduction. Um, you might ask yourself how someone who spent 31 years in the Navy and isn't an environmental scientist or an oceanographer and drove ships for a living, which burn a lot of fuel, by the way, um, got into sea level rise and climate change and, um, and has found it so compelling. Uh, when I retired in 14, I was asked to be a part of this working, this intergovernmental pilot project. We call it IPP, Intergovernmental Pilot Project. It does have the very long name that I put in my bio. Um, looking at a whole of government and community process that could be used as a template by other regions to sort out how to plan collaboratively to deal with sea level rise resilience, adaptation, mitigation in the Hampton Roads region. Um, and I agreed to take a committee. I agreed, I picked the infrastructure working group because I knew something about the flooding on the bases. That's, that's where all this started. That's, I just happened to have been exposed to that. Um, I knew nothing else about the issue in any significant detail. Um, but I very quickly found that this answered two big questions that I had ex dealt with, wrestled with, ever since I moved to Norfolk, Virginia in 2006. And they were, why do I live in a city that's not in a county? And why, whenever it rains, does the whole place submerge? Those two things turn out to be the heart of the matter. The reason I live in a city that's not in a county is because Virginia is a very strict Dillon rule interpreter. Um, only two states in the, in, in the country um, interpret the Dillon rule as strictly as, uh, as Virginia does, Virginia and Louisiana, interestingly enough. And what that means is that uh, under the Dillon rule, cities and municipalities, counties, derive their power directly and individually and independently exclusively from the state government. So they exist as individual entities. They are funded as individual entities. They do not have to collaborate. And in some cases, if they choose to collaborate, they could be stopped by the General Assembly. So for any sort of technical collaboration to take place, uh, any kind of collaborative organization that would exist in, would technically need general assembly approval. That combined with the way the Hampton Roads region actually came to be what it is, a lot of animosity created as the cities formed 100 years ago, has led to a very um, competitive environment between the cities and an absolute um, assertion that they must act independently, uh, they will act independently to solve all problems. And so they are reluctant to collaborate, they compete economically to, the, to their own detriment. Um, but you know, we see things in, in an area of 1.7 million people, um, everybody has their own fire department, everybody has their own police department, everybody has their own state government, everybody has their own SWAT team, everybody has their own, you know, and so you're like, well, wait, for, Portsmouth has 45,000 people, why do they need a SWAT team? Um, but anyway, I'm, I digress. This is how entrenched this is in the society, and this is creating a problem. This is creating a problem. Dale's been down there, and he, he's, he's seen it firsthand. Um, so just to set the stage for Hampton Roads, in case you haven't been there, um, it's very low. Uh, it's the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. The Hampton Roads Planning District Commission consists of 17 cities and municipalities that stretch basically from Williamsburg south to the North Carolina line in Virginia Beach. And on the south side, we call the south side and the north side, um, the, the peninsula boundary north is, is basically Williamsburg and James City County. Uh, they do share a school system, interestingly enough. Um, and on the south side, it's the North Carolina border and then west to Franklin and Isle of Wight County. So um, most of it is coastal in some way. It's either on the James River. The only thing that's really um, isolated is, is Franklin. Um, or it's part of the Chesapeake Bay, or it's on the York River. Um, 830 something miles of coastal shoreline, um, 1.7 million people, which we've talked about. 
it's, um, it's referred to as the world's largest cul-de-sac. So if you take I-64 down from Richmond, uh, you can make a big circle around through the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel, back through the Modern Merrimack Tunnel, and run back up I-64. So it really does look like a large cul-de-sac. It's at the end of that. It is, uh, interestingly, 40% of the economy, 45% of the economy is derived from federal agencies and entities that exist in the region. There's 27 different federal entities represented there with hundreds of facilities scattered throughout the region. Two-thirds of that is Defense Department, two-thirds of that is Navy. Of that two-thirds, there are things that don't exist anywhere else in the country. It's the only place we build carriers, it's the only place we refuel carriers, one of two submarine construction facilities in the country, the other is in Groton, and it's the world's largest naval station. So huge defense... Um, presence there, also true in the West Coast and in Southern California, but um, inundated throughout the community. It also is the fourth largest commercial port, container port on the East Coast of the United States, uh, the largest coal port on the East Coast of the United States. That's bad. We wish that would go away, in my opinion, but it's there and it's a big economic driver. Um, so we have a community that is tied to the water in many ways. Um, much of the um, tax base is, is based on waterfront property. Um, it's of great value. And, um, and, and so that kind of, spec I hope that sort of sets the stage for you what we're dealing with. It's a water-based economy in that it's, you know, largely focused on DOD and Navy, largely focused on the commercial <coughs> port, and uh, much of the tur tax base is tourism and waterfront property tax dollars. So the whole idea of this pilot project was to look at ways to collaborate across federal, state, and local and figure out how we can manage adaptation and sea level rise collaboratively and regionally. Um, the other interesting thing about this region is in addition to the seas rising, we're sinking. So we have kind of a double whammy. Uh, the sea level, the water inundation rate is twice that of the rest of the East Coast and second only to what New Orleans is experiencing. So, um, so we've seen more than 15 inches over the last 100 years of sea level rise increase and and it is uh, continuing, um, and we'll just see which sea level rise curve we end up on. But uh, in January of this year, NOAA issued a study that raised the expected curve heights for every curve. So those of you who are familiar with looking at sea level rise curves, inundation curves, there's a low, medium, you know, intermediate, intermediate, low, intermediate, high, high. Um, uh, projection issued by, by NOAA, um, and then our Virginia Institute of Marine Science has also validated that and added in subsidence impact for us locally, so we have our own particular curves. NOAA added half a meter to every curve for the southeastern coast of the United States and the western Gulf of Mexico. So if you were planning on 18 inches or so by the end of the century for the low curve, um, you can make that somewhere around three feet. And if you were planning on three feet by the end of the century or the turn of the century, you're up to four and a half. Um, so the challenge is, let's look at Virginia Beach. Average elevation, five feet above sea level. Even with a foot and a half of sea level rise inundation by the end of the turn of the century, what is that gonna do to the city of Virginia Beach? The n interesting nuance with sea level rise is, it doesn't just show up one day and then leave like a storm surge. It's there all the time. It doesn't just come in the front door, it comes in the back door. And so if we think about what we're gonna do in this region, which has, you know, not dissimilar to topography to a lot of the Netherlands, although it is very little of it is below sea level, um, we don't have an established system of dikes or berms or dams. Um, it's all coastal, it's all marshland, it's, or it's developed waterfront property, and it's a region that counts on being on that waterfront. So um, any th people say, oh, we'll just put a gate across the Chesapeake Bay. They put a gate across the Thames, we can put a gate across the Chesapeake Bay. Really? Well that's not gonna stop the water, the whole area is very low. Put a gate across the Elizabeth River, or the James River, that's not gonna work either. Um, so we have, we have a real series of challenges here. We have a wicked problem, uh, we have a water-based economy, we have a low area, we have 17 cities and municipalities who are d bound and determined that they're gonna be independent and, and we're sinking and, and the water's rising at a rapid rate. So that's, that's kind of where we are. Um, the results of the pilot project, which was a two-year effort, uh, we're, we're pretty interesting, and our challenge now is how to move forward with, with what we learned. Um, we, we did get some benefits out of, you know, starting out with an established charter, which is something that other pilots, um, there, were, there were actually, I should digress a little bit, there were four uh, federal pilots and three DOD pilots. This particular one was one of each of those, so it was on the federal list and it was on the um, 
Defense Department list. Um, we found that um, it was the first time that we really had federal, state, and local together. And in my working group in particular, people kept coming to the meetings because they said, I've never been in anything, any meeting, any circumstance looking at this issue where we have the federal folks, the state folks, and the local folks all together for the entire time. So that was helpful. But as has been mentioned by other speakers, some of the challenges are, you know, looking long term, how do you fund this? You know, the cities would say to me, man, all I want to do is just be able to work with the Navy and know that when they say they're going to put, you know, $500,000 or a million dollars or $10 million into a project, that money's going to be there. The way the cities run their budget and the way the feds run their budget are very different. They're working on a 10 year POM or a five year POM cycle, six year POM cycle. Um, execution plus five, it can change at any time. We're under a continuing resolution, so you know, no new projects can be started when that circumstance exists. And so there are, in fact, impediments to that by law and by policy that keep the federal government from working directly with communities to achieve you know, joint solutions to things. The Army Corps of Engineers gets involved. Um, and, and so it's, it's very challenging for the cities and the military, even if they want to work together, to work directly together to come up with projects directly that are directly, you know, linked. Um, and, and part of the challenge is, um, as you might imagine, with 17 cities and municipalities, they're all using different uh, data. They're all using different vertical data to plan against. This is shocking in the same planning district, but they are. Uh, they have different first full elevation requirements uh, across the different cities. They are using different sea level rise scenario planning curves. So. If we're going to plan collaborative as a region to solve these problems, we need to have unified standards that we're going to plan against. We should all be on the same vertical data. That could be done, but there just hasn't been enough energy and interest to do it yet. Um, we should all be using the same first floor building elevation st uh, standards. We should all be planning towards the same sea level rise scenario planning curve. And if we don't like that curve over time, we can update it. Um, but the challenge is getting people together to make these decisions initially. Um, we also found that um, there's a great need to have uh, support from consortium of universities. And these are actually consistent themes across what went on in New Orleans, uh, what's going on in Miami south, with the South Florida Compact, and even within the Dutch. Start with standards. Then have the support of a consortium of universities so you have the best available science and engineering. New Orleans has a regional data center collects all kinds of data, demographic data, economic data, financial data, you name it, they've got it. They produce products across the city, managing all kinds of information that the city really wasn't tracking before and wasn't really aware of. We don't really have a central point for that in the Hampton Roads region. We have a big economic piece that we look at. There's a state of the region done every year, state of the state. But from the perspective of, well, what about demographics? What about costs of insurance, uh, flooding, how many flood insurance claims are there within a year in the city of Norfolk? They don't know. And are those flood insurance, is, are there impacts to the real estate prices based on the fact that we're seeing more and more flooding? Hmm, well, Hampton knows that there are impacts on that. They've, they've been public about it. But other cities are less inclined to go public with that sort of thing. So we, we're just now starting to get a sense of are we being impacted economically? Is real estate being impacted? If it is, you know, what do we do about it? Um, we, we need to have collaborative regional planning. And so part of the challenge of what do you do is what do you want to save? Um, so Norfolk, using Norfolk as an example, they have a Vision 2100. They're really the first city. They fired the first shot across the bow saying, you know what, here are areas that are vulnerable to flooding by the turn of the century. Here are areas where we are probably gonna have to retreat to. Here are areas that are underserved, underbuilt, or elevated, and we wanna focus our future development in these areas. So, and they're looking now at how do we incentivize people to leave the areas that are gonna be high risk and motivate them to move to the areas that will be of less risk. And then further, how do we fund that? Um, if you go to the cities and say, you're going to buy everybody out? Nope, they are not going to do that. So do we set up, uh, you know, what kind of system, what kind of economic structure or strategy or entity do we set up to try to help uh, mitigate some of this, entice people to move, give people credits uh, if they're going to build in some of these uh, more desirable areas now because they have more high, they're higher. Um, how, can we, how can we give them, maybe they, they buy several properties from, from 
uh, people that are that are interested in moving, and then that counts as credit towards them being able to build in the area that we want them to build in. So Norfolk has just started to think about this, just started to think about it. No, none of the other cities are really are really there. And the challenge is, you know, Norfolk's laid all this out for their city. Well, that's 275,000 people right next door, and you can't tell the difference when you drive between one and the other. Is Virginia Beach, the largest city in the region, 475 roughly thousand people. If we, these two cities don't collaborate on this plan, they're going to find that they're going after the same stuff. Mm -hmm. Even though it's not in the same area, Virginia Beach, five feet above sea level, average elevation, is going to realize, hey, there's not enough room here for us to do what we want to do. So what's our plan going to be if we can't all fit where we are right now? Um, which is why this has got to be done regionally. There has to be a, a regional collaborated, collaborated effort to work this issue to help move forward. So, you know, that's an example in South in Louisiana. That's, there's, a, there's a regional organization. It's mostly funded by the city of New Orleans, but the policies and the things they have implemented and put in place are being followed by the other parishes. South Florida Compact, regional organization, coalition of the willing, if you will, moving forward together. Even the Dutch have done this in many of their areas where they've had to make big changes. Um, so really the heart of the issue for Hampton Roads is we must collaborate regionally. We have to do this planning as a collaborative body or it isn't gonna be successful. And then of course, as both, both of my colleagues have mentioned, um, what are the funding strategies for this? Are, are we doing resilience bonds? Are we doing cap bonds? What are the motivations there? Um, and yet when you ask about that in the Hampton Roads region, what do you know about resiliency bonds? You typically get a blank stare. Other than the city of Norfolk, who is one of the 100 resilient cities designated by the Rockefeller Foundation, who gets a lot of help, and, uh, and, and from that foundation, a lot of great ideas and, and support uh, with their future planning. So we're, we're, we're I, would, I would honestly say we're at a turning point in Hampton Roads. Over the last 10 years since I've lived there, we've seen more and more water. water. Um, every new storm event is a new flooding adventure. Last year in August, we had a 10 inch rain event, almost unheard of to have double digit rain in Hampton Roads, unless you've got a, a major storm. 10 inch rain event, 13 inch rain event, then we had Hurricane Matthew. Water showed up all kinds of places it had never been before. And, and everyone acted surprised, you know, oh, how could this happen? Well, there's, you know, 15 more inches of water around than there used to be. The soil was completely saturated, the water table is high and growing higher and and suddenly we have communities in Virginia Beach where you know people open their door and their their garage is full, is full of water um, and and it turns out that a lot of those communities because I have friends who live in one of them you know the water table is only 18 inches below mm -hmm. the surface of the water anyway the guy goes out in his yard and digs to work on his landscape lighting and he's got to bring a pump so why do they even build there mm -hmm. and this is the real challenge for the region so much of the economic engine for the last 25, 30 years has been building. And they've been expanding south, and all the open territory in Virginia Beach, let's build more, let's build more. That's been driving the economy. Well, now they're expanding into places that, you know, there's a reason why they were strawberry fields. And that's because it's low and flat. And if it floods and it's a strawberry field, nobody cares. But if it floods and it's a housing development, you've got a different set of problems. So um, the real challenge for us is, um, and this makes the whole thing even more complex, the water's not coming in from the front, it's coming in from the back coming up from Pamlico Sound. Uh, it's coming in from the Inland Waterway. Um, so, so we have some real hard questions to ask ourselves. And I, I really commend Norfolk for being the first to, to start to have this conversation. But as a region, what do we want to look like in 80 years? That's the real challenge for us. And, and we won't look like we are now. We will have to learn to live with water, to manage where the water goes, and to sort out policies to allow us to retreat gracefully. And I know the Dutch mantra is kind of berm, pond, and pump, but um, you know, how do we do that? How do we position ourselves? And, and what is the vision for what Hampton Woods will be in the next, you know, by the turn of the century? Um, it's, it, it's a wicked problem and we're right, we're right on the cusp of it. So um, it's, it's fascinating to hear what the other, what the other uh, communities are, are dealing with. Um, and I would really say, um, you know, well, you probably don't know this, in, in naval aviation, which I'm not an aviator, but in naval aviation, um, one of their flying mantras is, I think, the four Cs or the five Cs. But the four Cs are um, confess, climb, conserve, communicate. And it starts with confess, you know, admit that you're lost. And, and in this case, it's admit you have a problem. And then how are you going to plan for it 
How are you going to bond together to come up with solutions? What do you want to save? You know, Norfolk has done that work. They know what they want to save. Virginia Beach is doing that work, kind of. Um, but really, the whole region needs to do it. And then, then you start to have the conversation about you can't save everything. And so where do you go from there? How do you structure yourself? Um, how do you, you know, conserve what you want to conserve and turn back to nature that which is going there anyway? And, and then how do you get the word out to people? How do you educate people? We heard that all morning long, too, about the, the importance of education. But um, I'm kind of on a, on a one-woman show to take those outcomes from the pilot project and get them to the city governments. And what I'm finding as I go around is there's a shocking lack of understanding of federal policy, state policy, funding strategies. Um, and you know, I, I think a lot of people just think, oh, this will be OK. It'll, it'll, it'll take care of itself. We got $120 million on a HUD grant, right? So um, there's, just, there's just so much more to do. So it's, been, it's fascinating. Um, I continue to find it fascinating. I don't want to leave you with the thinking that nothing is happening in Hampton Roads. Norfolk's doing great work. Virginia Beach is working on a very sophisticated study. Hampton is working on an urban water plan as a result of the Dutch dialogues. Um, Norfolk has taken a lot that they learned from the Dutch dialogues and is moving forward with that. You know, there are certainly efforts underway in many places, but unless they're collaborated, we're in for long-term problems in Hampton Roads. So I wanted to ask a few questions for the panel. Um, and these are great examples of what, you know, what should be done, what could be done in terms of discussing and planning uh, for these kind of inevitable impacts of climate change. You know, clearly in New Orleans, we were confronted with it in a very visible way, and you couldn't ignore it. Uh, I think there are other coastal communities that, that can ignore it uh, and that are really, you know, the whistling past the graveyard are, aren't necessarily where they should be. Uh, as Serge noted, if, you know, you aren't in on it, you're behind. But I think right. our nature, our tendency is to, to be behind until we can't afford to be anymore. It seems to be work that really lends itself to bipartisan support. So I would like to ask the panel what tips they have for local activists to kind of start these conversations in their communities. Um, how do you engage across the aisle? How do you begin the discussion about pro uh, proactively dealing with climate change impacts? Uh, and you know, if you've done that already, let's let's hear it. I know the Dutch Dialogues is a is a very unique model in terms of how to engage. I think there might be some uh, some takeaways there. If you want to start us off, Dale. So the Dutch Dialogues is just, is just a workshop model um, where we're just trying to force people who normally don't talk to each other because they like their silos. We just force them together to try to solve a problem, plan towards a goal. And what you find then is common understanding of a, of a problem um, develops as well as possible solutions will develop from different perspectives. And you can use that then to to go forward. It, it's, it's brilliant and it's as simple as it gets, right? So it's just a way to to sort of agitate the local authorities to do something or think differently. I want to have, have two comments just about, just to illustrate this issue on governance. So our number one recommendation coming out of the Dutch, dialogue, the Dutch dialogues in Norfolk and Hampton Roads was fix your governance. It wasn't build this or do that, or it was fix your governance. And I'll give you a perfect example. During the Dutch dialogues, we asked Virginia Beach and we asked Norfolk. They, they're right next to each other. To, to come talk to us and see if we could help them solve a problem. Virginia Beach listened to us and they said, nope, nope, we don't want to participate. Norfolk said, yes, we want to participate. And we said, yeah, we're trying to solve this problem perhaps in Pretty Lake. Now, Pretty Lake is a, is a bay, sort of um, uh, estuary bay, that the border between Virginia Beach and Norfolk share. So this is this, this, the border goes between these, it goes along this water body. Norfolk saying, we need to plan for Pretty Lake. We got all this, this recurrent flood loss, and we're losing a lot of property. We need to do something. And Virginia Beach said, sorry. And Virginia Beach still says sorry, because Virginia Beach doesn't want to recognize their problem until maybe last summer. We hear things are changing oh, because of Matthew. Yeah, no, I, I it. Yeah, because of Matthew. And then also, um, they don't want to antagonize the Navy, which has a crucial facility there, because there's a lot of federal funds from the Navy that go into Virginia Beach. Thus, unless the governance is fixed, this is not going to be fixed. Um, bipartisanship, this isn't a partisan issue. Flood, flood water doesn't respect political party. We can talk about the conservative heartland in the US. Remember those rain floods that destroyed parts of Colorado not too long ago? Or how about the 41 inches of rain in conservative East Baton Rouge? 
last summer. Mm -hmm. How about conservative in South Carolina? Charleston got whacked two years ago. Houston has this problem. There are so many places in the U.S. that has this problem. This is not an issue. One last thing. In, in 2012, no, 2011, massive floods along the Mississippi River. You remember this? Yeah. Massive floods. And this was a 300-year event. Um, so water level, so the, the water level in the Mississippi River varies 50, 50 feet per year. I mean, 50 feet, 50 feet per season. 50 feet, so that's a lot. So in one year, the water levels were 50 plus because of the floods. The next year, remember the drought? They were down. And so how does an inland city, you don't get much further from the coast than St. Louis, how do they deal with this? This is a climate change problem. We need to just, we're getting get stranger weather, we need to prepare for it, or there's a lot at risk. We're gonna lose a lot of economic activity, we're gonna kill a lot of people if we don't deal with this. It's, it's as simple as that. And to say it's a partisan issue is just baloney. So, you know, we did, when we embarked on our sea level rise stuff, it actually coincided with El Nino, one of the most powerful El Ninos last year. And so we, we decided to tie the El Nino planning and, and sort of response to sea level rise workshops as well. So we had one of the most well attended workshop in our city's history on coastal flooding, which was great. And I, I think that's the word, operative word is flooding and water. Everyone gets that. And the blue collar community, you get, we, we've got to deal with this stuff. Like it, it's, not, it's not fancy scientific stuff. It's not climate change models. It's like, here's the flooding right now. It's gonna get worse. And then by the way, here's the fire department, the sheriff's department, the lifeguard departments. Let's get some sandbags. And we're on social media all the time. I decided to become a spokesperson in San Diego on the media talking about what we're doing. And so we just really opened it up. And then finally our consultants, I just talked to our new consultants and said, do you get it? Do you get how to work in a blue collar community and respect people and treat people like they're normal human beings and don't talk down to them? Our last guy, Dave Revel, who's a scientist, is a surfer, real down to earth guy. A, a new, uh, new guy, um, Daryl Hathaway, who's a coastal guy on this planning process, is a surfer and they know how to come to the community. They surf with people in the morning, they hang out, wear flip flops. And in our community, having those types of people help on this makes all the difference between success and failure. So, but everyone likes to help, like if you get people engaged in solving problems, like it's flooding, let's all work together to, to solve it. That goes a much longer way into talking about climate models and, and things that we all believe in, but ultimately don't help you solve the problem. So we're trying to be a, a real functional, practical, non-political approach. And I think if you look at all of us, probably that's the approach we're taking. One of the challenges in Virginia is, um, so the governor is only elected for a four-year term and can't be reelected. And so we have this kind of flip-flopping of there's a Democratic governor, we're all about climate change. There's a Republican governor, he's a denier, everything stops. So, so we just had this. I mean, we had four years of, of Governor Kane, and we've got a governor's commission on climate change, and we're going down this path, and we're going to have a plan, and everything's great. Then we had Governor McConnell, for climate change denier. Stop all climate change. No climate change can be used. We won't talk about climate change. We won't talk about sea level rise. It's recurrent flooding. Okay? Recurrent flooding. And we have an election next year. Now we have a Democratic governor again. He started it all back up, but there's a difference this time, too. The Senate and the House of Delegates are all Republican, not Republican majority. So, so we have this impasse with, you know, McAuliffe wants it, they don't want it. They want it, he won't sign it. So it, that, that's part of the, you know, welcome to Virginia. Um, and then on top of that, you got the Dillon rule, and everybody's fighting amongst themselves anyhow. Also, much of the power in the House of Delegates and in the state Senate comes from the western part of the state. Coal money, former coal money. Uh, so Hampton Roads has a delegation that, because of the nature of the cities and the nature of the districts, tends to be competitive within itself. Once again, we're not unified. Just, you know, united we fail, divided we, you know, we've, united we stay and divided we fail or fall. Um, uh, or as my husband likes to say, cooperate to graduate, but um, they don't have a strong coalition, even on issues that are bipartisan within the Hampton Roads District, so they can't make any progress at the state level. This year, four or five proposals were made to the state government, everything from funding a resiliency officer for the state, funding some kind of engineering entity to do planning in the Hampton Roads region, uh, on sea level rise exclusively, a um, couple other things, um, all were never even got out of committee um, because it, the joke in the paper was, oh, another bill from Hampton was, you know, and the guy's throwing it over his shoulder. So 
so we have very, because we are not united in, at the state level in the House of, of Delegates and the Senate, we don't have very good success rate with um, moving uh, legislation forward. Uh, and at the federal level, I, I would say kind of the same thing. I mean, I think Scott Rigel, who is retired, um, was a, you know, I thought he was conservative, but now he's looking kind of moderate, um, <laughs> Republican, who worked fairly well within the, the delegation for, for the state. Um, the gerrymandering of districts is really peculiar in our part of the state. Bobby Scott, who's the Democrat, basically has the edges of, of the river. Um, and um, so, so that's a little bit strange, but, um, and then we have the two Democratic senators. So at the federal level, eh, remains to be seen, got some new players on the scene, so we'll see what happens there. But the real challenge, again, comes back to, um, you know, this was 200 people in this pilot project, professionals, stormwater engineers, career people, architects, builders, city planners, people who had done this for their entire careers, who know their problems that need to be solved and wanted to solve them. They worked together to come up with you know, these recommendations. They took lessons. We read every, well, my group was started to read every study we could find that was about this, that could impact Hampton Roads or was about Hampton Roads. I have 10 pages. If you want to look at the website, uh, www.floodingresiliency.org. That's where the report is. Uh, and, and you have to Google, I, search for IPP phase two report. But um, in my segment alone, there's a 10 page reference list of all these studies we found and I keep finding more. Um, so, but, but within the region, this was kind of passed off as, because the, the planning, the cities don't want to collaborate. This was, a, this was a think tank exercise. This was just a think tank. Um, this was not a think tank, this was a, dedicated study. We actually studied the Pretty Lake area. We picked that because there were two cities and a federal a base right in the middle and they share a border um, and looked at ways that they could move forward to take Norfolk's solution and expand it to help everyone in that area. The federal agent, the, the base, which floods terribly, and the Virginia Beach side and the Norfolk side. Um, that's all in there. But, uh, but the real challenge is they have got to collaborate to move forward. And, and there's just this entrenched challenge to that locally. And, and so um, there's a great, um, actually Roger Sorkin's in the, in the, in the room, filmmaker, uh, just finished a movie about the region and, and the challenges of, of recurrent flooding and, and really sea level rise and climate change, although those two words are not, those four words are not in the, in the movie. Um, and, um, and, and how that impacts national security in a negative <coughs> way, and, which is something the region really could be building on. They could really be playing this up. Look, national security, naval base, big problem, do something, federal government, if they could just collaborate. Um, and uh, you know, I would commend the movie, it just came out March 20th, um, to you, certainly, uh, because it really shows at the grassroots level what's going on there. And, and how people are being impacted. And um, well, I guess one final story, in this restoration I'm doing in my neighborhood, I'm late, okay, I'm sorry. Um, if I said climate change or sea level rise to the community, half the people in the room would get up and leave. But as long as I say, fix the flooding, uh, restore the native species, take care of our, increase our property values, make our neighborhood better, they're all over it. So messaging and is, is important. we can protect our ocean and our blue economy and our community.